This episode is brought to you by my friends at Very, the creators of the famous stand-up Veridesk and other office furniture. If you're like me, you're suddenly working from home. My best productivity tip is to set up a dedicated workspace. My comfy couch or the kitchen table so close to the refrigerator and snacks wasn't really working for me. So I recently set up a fully loaded home office setup using office furniture pieces from Very, and now I've got a whole mission control in a separate room for my kids and the dogs ready to roll. Very has everything you need to transform your home workspace, from desks, ergonomic chairs, and converters that transform any table in your home into a standing desk. Products are super easy to set up by yourself with little or no assembly, usually within minutes. Shipping is free in the US and most items ship out next business day. Right now you can save 10% off Very Home Office products with the code WFH2020. See the full collection and save at Very.com. That's V-A-R-I dot com and use the code WFH2020 and check out to save 10%. Now let's get back to the show. Dan Pink is the author of six outstanding books about business and human behavior. His books include the long-running New York Times bestsellers, When and A Whole New Mind, as well as Drive and To Sell as Human. Dan's books have won multiple awards, have been translated into 40 languages, and sold millions of copies. Before venturing out on his own 20 years ago, Dan worked in several positions in politics and government, including serving from 1995 to 1997 as chief speechwriter for Vice President Al Gore. He did his undergrad at Northwestern and a JD from Yale Law School. He's also received honorary doctorates from Georgetown University, the Pratt Institute, and a few others. He's a diehard baseball fan rooting for the Washington Nationals in his hometown of DC with his family. Dan says, we are all in sales now. And yet for some, the mere mention of sales conjures up images of the typical pushy, even can't trust him as far as I can throw him car salesman who approaches you with that fake enthusiasm upon visiting any given dealership. Some of us can sell snow to an Eskimo, but for others it ranks up there with public speaking as one of their least favorite things to do. Is being good at sales something we're born with? Or can it be learned? If what Dan says is correct, that we're all in sales now. I guess we should hunker down and figure this stuff out. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with best-selling author Dan Pink. So tell me about the book and who you wrote it for. Well, I wrote this book for two groups of people and they're actually reflected in the book itself. So if you look at, we have this notion that salespeople have disappeared because of the internet. Not true. One in nine Americans one in nine American workers works in sales. Their job is to get people to buy stuff. But in this book, I have research showing that those other eight and nine, they're in sales too. They're spending huge portions of their time persuading, convincing, influencing people, uh, gathering teammates to do a project, asking a boss for a raise, raising money from investors. And the totality of it is essentially we're all in sales now. And the book is for people who do sales sales. And it's for the rest of us, the eight and nine of us, who do what I call non-sales selling. So you find that most people are not attracted to selling? I mean, it's kind of a turnoff? Most people are repelled, yeah. <laughs> not even not attracted. They're outwardly repelled by this. They, they think of sales as slimy and cheesy and sleazy. Yeah, it's in the category total, of... Total lowbrow. I mean, they, they, they have images in their heads of guys in bad sport coats selling crappy used cars. Yeah. Uh, Herb Tarlek from WKRP. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, sales has a terrible, terrible connotation. And, and why does it have such a stigma, you think? Well, I think that's an interesting question, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to get at here. I think that that view of sales, the view that it's about the low road and duplicity and hoodwinkery, is very outdated. That view of sale tells us, to my mind, much more about the conditions in which sales have taken place rather than about sales itself. And what I mean by that is this. Most of what we know about sales is for a world of information asymmetry, where the seller always had more information than the buyer. When the seller has more information than the buyer, the seller can rip you off. It's not even close. So, I mean, gr the best example are, are, are cars. 20 years ago, you go in to buy a Nissan. The Nissan dealer is going to know a lot more about cars than you will, period. He's certainly going to know a lot more about Nissans than you. Right. Now, not so much. And so, this, so we have this connotation of that sales is sleazy and lowbrow and low rent because of information asymmetry. But when information asymmetry disappears, we have to rethink what we think of sales. And right. what, what, what this world of information parity or close to it has done is moved us from a world where 
from buyer beware to a world of seller beware. Now the sellers have to be on notice because the buyers suddenly have a lot more power. Buyers used to have few choices, not much information, and no way to talk back. Right. Now they've got lots of choices, lots of information, and lots of ways to talk back. So let's unpack that just a little bit because yep. that's good stuff. Um, so how did we get there in the first place? You say uh, it, it's not an equal playing ground. Right. I get that. And the internet has probably changed everything. Huge, yeah. Right, where we go and do our research online and right. we figure out and do cost comparisons with a click right. of a button and all kinds of calculators out there. Resources are there for sure. But isn't it a lot perpetuated by the people themselves? In what way? So there's this turn off, right, of the, I can think of the door to door sales. Oh, yeah. Style oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. But because here's the thing, because that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. I mean, I mean, all of these kinds of, that you're talking about, all these kinds of conventions of the classic form of sales are ineffective now. You think about something like the advice ABC always be closing, this yeah. kind of steamroller driving to get people to sign on a line that is dotted. Yeah. That doesn't work when consumers have lots of choices, when they can talk back and tell everyone you're a sleazebag. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, it, 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 and, what, and this is actually central to the whole book, which is that this world of seller beware is a, a v different in kind, not different in degree, different in kind from a world of buyer beware. It calls on a fundamentally different suite of abilities. Let's point out for those people who are salespeople and you know, that's their job and they, they either love it or they hate it, but let's talk about some of the things that are less obvious that they're doing wrong. That, you know, maybe they think, I am a great person, I am a great salesperson, I'm always closing, but let's identify some of the other things that may be more subtle that, are, that they can improve on right away. That they can improve on? Okay, yeah, so, so what are they doing wrong? Well, I mean, it depends on the person, obviously, but, but what, what, let's talk, some of the things they can do better are, are this. Um, let's talk about something at the very, very mundane, let me give you something at the very, very tactical level, listening. People don't know how to listen. Right. And it's not their fault. In school, we learn how to read, we learn how to write, Nobody teaches us how to listen. Well, we have ears, so that allows us to hear, but we, no one ever teaches us how to listen. It's as if human beings emerge from the womb able to do this <laughs> complex thing called listening. So one very, very small thing that people can do to get better at listening, which is something I learned in researching the book, is that just every once in a while or you know, at certain points, when someone says something to you, just wait a couple of seconds before responding. Right. Just wait. So why don't you think people are good at listening? I mean, what's the, what's the fundamental problem? Are they thinking about what they want to say while the other person is talking? Is I, it think that a lot of, uh, I think that a lot of, especially men, I think more males than females, yeah. are just basically they're not listening because they're preparing their next comment. Yeah. I think part of it is that, again, goes back to the idea that no one ever taught them how to do it. So they're not even, it's not something that they readily can do. If you, get, if you go to someone and say, hi, go hit a curveball, you know, um, they could probably use a little instruction on that before mm -hmm. they do it. Now you can put somebody and hit a curveball, and eventually they're going to do it probably okay. But if they had a little instruction, they would do it more than okay. And so to me, it's an, you know it's an it's analogous to that. Gotcha. There are other things that people can do. I mean, all, I mean, small tactical things that people can do. Yeah. One of the qualities that matters most today is this quality of attunement, and that's understanding someone's perspective. Can you understand someone's perspective? See the world through their eyes. Yeah. All kinds of things you can do in that. That's a lot of empathy, isn't it? Well, it's interesting. It's sort of a, it's a, it's a fraternal twin of empathy. Uh, and this is actually a really important point that you identified here, is that perspective taking is what social, social psychologists call this. And it's obviously the ability to take someone's perspective. It's not quite like empathy. Let me give you an interesting study okay. that, that demonstrates this, because it, it helped me understand this a little bit better. Okay. So, group of people sent into a negotiation, a study about a negotiation. So they send people into a negotiation setting to negotiate the sale of a gasoline station. It's one of the sort of classic packages of negotiation experiments. And so half the people, they say, go into this negotiation, focus on what the other side is thinking. Go into this negotiation, focus on the other side's interests. Second group has a slightly different set of instructions. They have the same material, same facts. Focus on what the other side is feeling, focus on the other side's emotions. Okay, so one side is focus on their thinking and their yeah. interests, the other side, their feelings and their emotions. So which, it's figuring out what moves the needle, like which, what they care about. And which side does, well, which side does better? The ones focused on the thinking or the ones focused on the emotions? I'm gonna guess feeling. Thinking. Oh, really? Exactly, that's what's interesting about it. So it's not quite like empathy. It actually is a little bit more muscular than that. It's about, it's, it's a more kind of, and this was a surprise to me, it's more of a, a, it's more of a analytic, cognitive kind of skill. And so this isn't going to hurt you thinking about their emotions at all. It's going to give you other kinds of information. But essentially, you should use your head at least as much as your heart 
in in doing these kinds of things. So is it about you know in classical you know uh, debate kind of style? You're sort of already diffusing what they're probably thinking. You don't know for sure, but like you sort of offer it up there like this. I know that you're probably thinking this, and therefore we've already addressed that. But what we really want to present is something like that. Is that what you're talking about? When Somet so, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's really just understanding. It's like you know, it's like what's going to make your life better. Yeah. What do you need? Yeah. And so if I if I listen and I try to see the world through your through your eyes, okay. it becomes I become much better. I, I become much more effective in helping us move to something that is valuable for both of us. So it's like marketing, where you're trying to find pain points and solve those pain points. It's yeah, it's some of that. It's some of that. I mean, that's that goes. There's another principle that I talk about. I have to talk about the new ABCs: attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Clarity is, I think, akin to that. It could be because now there is a premium on less on problem solving as a skill and more on problem finding. If it goes back to what you were saying earlier, if customers know precisely what their problem is, precisely what the problem is, they can find the answer. They can find the solution. Where you're more valuable is if they don't know what their problem is or they're wrong about their problem, and you can identify a problem they don't realize that they have. Or you can look down the road and say, here's a problem that you're going to confront. You get it, better get ready for it right now. Problem solving, see, this is interesting, because it, sort of, it, 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 it sort of balances out the other one. Yeah. Problem solving is very much a kind of analytic skill. Problem finding is a much more creative and conceptual skill. Interesting. So how do you develop these skills? And I mean, we, there's no classes to take from no. being a better listener. Uh, your book is probably a great start, but um, what else can you offer us? Oh, there's so many. There, there actually, there's a lot of really small, interesting things that everybody can do. Okay. And, and actually, the book, one of the things, I, I actually architected this book in a particular way for that very reason. So what, I, what I've done is, is started the book by making an argument. We're all in sales now, but sales isn't what it used to be. Okay? Then, so now what do we do about it? So there are three qualities, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity, and then three particular tactical abilities to pitch, to improvise, and to serve. And so for each of those, those things, I look at the social science telling us, what does the social science tell us about attuning ourselves? What does the social science tell us about clarity and, and buoyancy, which is basically staying afloat in an ocean of rejection? <laughs> and then, so, so I love that metaphor, yeah. by the way. So, <laughs> uh, so along with, along, so, so along with like, the science, it's like science tells, here's what we learned about attunement. Each chapter has some exercises and tools and t lots of exercises and tools and tips to help you get better at this kind of thing. Give me a simple term for the word attunement. You know, give me a synonym. Perspective taking. Okay. Seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Okay. Yeah. Um, that that that's really that that's really what it is. Okay. And so, but it's sort of um, but what's so interesting? It's a fascinating it's a fascinating topic because it has so many different dimensions. It's 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 very much a full fledged human capability. So it has as we mentioned before, that cognitive side, which is really powerful. It has, in some ways, a social side, too, because the research shows very clearly that people who feel a sense of power, people who feel greater status, are terrible at this. That there's an inverse relationship between power and perspective taking. Is that because they feel like they're giving up power when they do it? Probably. To someone else? That's part of it. Um, yeah. They tend to be very anchored in their own positions. Right. Um, they tend to want to reinforce that power, a, it, which is sort of another way of putting what you just said. And they go, they, they go awry because of that. This is, I mean, it's why yeah. people don't like their boss. Some people don't like their bosses. Um, yeah. It's, and, and so it's why some people don't like their teachers. And so this has many applications. I mean, this is like a behavioral science uh, book as well, where you, I mean, you oh sure, yeah, it crosses over anger management and oh, you know, no, people skills. It, it's basically it's because there isn't you know there you know if you again if you if you if this argument if the catalyzing argument is right or let's just say it's more right than wrong. All of us are in some form of sales now, like it or not. Yeah. But sales isn't what it used to be because of information asymmetry. Then what do you do about it? And the thing is. You can go to the, you can go to say you can go to classics the, the typical sales books most of which are not very good, or you can, um, and there so I say let's go to the social science. But it isn't as there's somebody out there studying the social science of sales. Right. It's scattered all over the place, but the behavioral science gives us some clues, some really powerful clues about how to do these things a little bit better. All right. So then, uh, once we get a handle on knowing some of the things that we're doing wrong, is there anything else we want to cover in that category? What, what else we're doing wrong, you know, we're not listening well. We're not oh, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, um, if, you, if, we think about, if we think about attunement, you know, you, what you can do, we talked about power, what you can do in attunement is you can, when you go into an encounter, you can say, you basically say, hey, maybe this person 
uh, needs me less than I need that person. So even if you have a, if you're nominally more powerful, you have higher status, or you have some control over that person, kind of reduce your power a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's a very easy thing that people can do. If every boss did that, the world would be a better place. And does that mean not just in attitude, but also maybe in posture and what you're wearing? So, well, you got that right because yeah. one of the interesting things about one of the interesting things about 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 this whole concept of attunement is it is fully formed human. So it's, it's cognitive, it's about the social side, this power relationship, but it's also physical. And I think about Mark Zuckerberg, you know, arguably one of the most powerful guys on the planet right now. You know, hoodie, jeans, right. sneakers, right. very unassuming, right. but like, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I mean, that's a, that, can be an effect, that can be an effective way to do things. Uh, I wonder what kind of listener he is. That'd be very interesting to find out. But w the physical component of it has to do, in some ways, with mimicry. So mimicry sounds duplicitous. It sounds like you're trying to scam somebody, like you're trying to fake them out. That's not, it's just not it. Human beings are natural mimickers. You go to a college campus and watch people who like each other talk to each other. You go to a shopping mall. You go to a busy downtown area. Yeah. You see human beings mirroring each other's posture, the w repeating, using the same kinds of phrases. Yeah, I think of the Seinfeld of episode with the soup Nazi and everyone is, you know, conforming to the way it should be, you know? Yeah, it's, right, it's, 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 less, uh, it's less pernicious than the soup Nazi, though. So, but but it's inter that's an interesting example because basically people want to actually reflect what the soup, they want to understand things from the soup Nazi's point of view so they can get their soup. So, um, but human beings do this naturally, and what you can do is you can get a little bit better at understanding someone's perspective by being more conscious of how they're sitting, what their posture is, what kind of gestures they're using, and appears, it also is in the words that are used. So a lot of, where a lot of people in technical sales run aground is that they use only their own vocabulary, not right. the customer's vocabulary. Right. And, and so instead of repeating back the customer's vocabulary, they use their own technical um, specialized vocabulary. Right. And so it seems like they're You don't understand arrogant what I'm talking about. Or arrogant. Yeah. Or, you know. Oh, it's partly arrogance, but it's also partly, okay, so you didn't understand what I just said, and I don't understand what you just said. When you have the buyer and the seller, each one saying, I don't understand what you just said, I'm guessing that usually doesn't lead to a sale. You have a problem, yeah. Just tell, send me to the website. I'll read it there, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. If the people writing the website are attuned to their customers. Right. Okay, um, so what do we do once we arrive there? We, we have accepted the fact that we have a problem, and now we want to solve it. Right. So let's talk about that. On which dimension? Well, um, let's just talk about what everyone wants, and that's I want more sales. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it, the thing is, that if you want more sales, you're going to have to really work hard at it. There are all kind, you know, it's a whole suite of abilities that yeah. you're going to have to do. Well, the precursor to that is building great relationships, mm. right, and everything you've talked about, but it's... it's does it come down to building relationships? Yes and no. I mean, relationships matter. There's no question about that. Um, but what matters more and more now is expertise. Uh, expertise is mattering much more. In traditional sales, expertise is mattering much, much more. Uh, again, it goes back to the information. What you have now is you have in, bi in business to business sales, and I know you have viewers in that space. In business to business sales, you have customers coming much later in the sales process because they're able to do a lot of their own research, a lot of their own due diligence and right. time. So if they're, you, you, you're not giving them the rudimentary course, they're already doing the rudimentary course on their own. They need to, when they come in to talk to you, they need people who actually know what's going on. Right. And so there's a lot of information out and there. And they don't just want that, they demand it, right? I mean, it's, it's not just the standard, but it's the way you can Right, because if you don't, well, here's the thing. If you, if you don't do that, someone else will so you're going to you're going to lose out on that and you're actually not serving your customer you didn't necessarily have to be an expert right. in the past you had to know more than the other person more than the buyer but now the buyer can get up to speed pretty darn quickly and so you have to have some legitimate expertise again to talk as we said before to move from problem solving to problem finding there's a huge array of information out there so if you're an expert you can distill it reduce it to its essence um, another really, I mean, it's good, let me give you a good vivid example here. The, the, the candy company, um, Profetti Von Melli, makes Mentos. Okay, Mentos are awesome. They're delicious. They're fantastic. They're, they're not even a sponsor. And you can do funny things with... With Coke bottles, yeah. yeah. Or any so, kind of soda, right? Is it any soda? I think with anything with carbonation. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. So get some Mentos, everyone. Mentos. So you have these, 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 these men and women who are salespeople for 
Mentos. And so they make sales calls on mom and pop convenience stores, bodegas, those kinds of small little operations. Yeah. Now, their, their job, you think, is, okay, got to get them to order as many Mentos as possible. But they don't do that. They do something else. Th using their data from their company, as well as some, whatever kind of data they can get from the retailer, yeah. they go in there and say, okay, we understand your business. We're going to crunch these numbers. We're going to look at the demographics of this area. We're going to take your numbers. We're going to take our numbers. And we're going to recommend to you a suite of products uh, to offer in your store that we know based on our data and the demographics and everything else is going to be advantageous to you. Now, the, the offerings that they recommend to them include things from their competitors. They're not only saying buy, oh, you need to buy 800,000 Mentos. They're saying, right. here's the th based on our expertise, here's what we think is going to be the most effective way for you to sell more stuff at your convenience store. And so, yeah. and, and... So that's a trust builder, that's a value add. It's, it's hugely, it's hugely valuable because what, and, and it seems, in the, if you only focus on the short term, it can be counterproductive because you could go in there and say, you know what, here at this particular place, you only need five varieties of Mentos, not seven. Right. But what is it, so, so what does it does? That's a salesperson who's welcomed back. And here's, what, here's the way they look at it, and this goes to the central point. They say, we're selling insights about the confections business. We're not selling Mentos, we're selling insights about the confections business. If they are experts in the confections business, if they provide insights in the confections business, then that's ultimately gonna down to their benefit in selling yeah. Mentos. That's a great new way to reframe that. It's a, it's a, I think it's, and it's, it's becoming more and more, more and more prevalent. It makes me think uh, of the retail industry where a lot of the POs are, they call it on wheels, you know, so they'll buy in X number of whatever, board shorts and sneakers, whatnot, and then, you know, they'll ship 75% of it back if it doesn't sell and they have all these, you know, guarantees and, and, uh, different deals that they do, but if they went in knowing the right number, they right. wouldn't have all that waste. Right, you know, exactly. That, that exactly. applies to any industry. Um, you, you, you got that right. And the thing is, that I means so that's, that's a very different kind of, of, it's a very different skill. It's not yeah. going in there and saying, hey, let's go out, let me take you out to lunch, and if I buy you a nice lunch, and I'm friendly enough, maybe you'll order six kinds of Mentos and five kinds of Mentos. Yeah. Well, maybe you do it once, but it's like the fool me once, shame on, Yeah. right? Um, so that's the higher law then. That's the future. That's what we're not doing. We're not doing the research. We're, you know, if I'm the sales guy, I yeah, don't you, know. You have, to, you, have to be able to have the, you have to be able to have the expertise. If you go in there and, and you simply, if, if you go, the, the, the mistake some people make is, rec is not understanding the ferocious impact of the information parity that's not, out there. Not understanding their own business well enough is what exactly. you're saying. Exactly. So We've got to become better experts at our own that business. Is, that is an incredibly important thing. You have to have the personal skill of being able to be attuned to people. And then also, you know, we talk, the, the, the B in the ABCs is buoyancy, which is anybody in sales, anybody in anything. I mean, you run a business, I run a business, you have a lot of entrepreneurs watching this. Uh, basically, all of us spend a lot of time getting rejected. Right. We hear no a lot. And it turns out, if you look at the science, that how you respond to that those notes, how you deal with rejection is yeah. a very good predictor for your success. So I know I, for one, would really love to know that answer because uh, probably a lot of people watching this feel like me. It's like I have an obviously great idea and I want you to accept it right. and agree that it's as good as I know that it is. Right. And yet, um, almost the default answer is, nah, I'm not interested. Yeah. I don't want it. Yeah. Um, so, so how do we deal with that? What's the best way to react? You know, Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania gives us some really tangible, tactical things that we can do to deal with those kinds of settings. I hope you don't tell me to be super cheery and put on a smiley face because that just seems so fake. You're exactly right. But yeah. there is some evidence that actually that cheeriness can be effective in other kinds of circumstances, which we can get to in a moment. Okay. Here's the thing. Seligman, one of the, one of the giants of social psychology in the last 50 years, he wanted to understand how people deal with rejection. So who did he study, of course? Life insurance salesmen. Okay. So he goes to this group of life insurance salesmen in Pennsylvania. So let me try to put Seligman's ideas into action. Here. Role play it. Yeah, we'll role play it, okay? So I'll be the, the seller and you just, you just reject me. Okay. Won't be hard. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let's say I'm trying to sell, you know, let's say I, I say to you, you know, I've got this, um, uh, this great uh, vacation home and you and your family can have it for, 
two weeks a year at a great price. Brian, are you with me? Yeah, no, not really feeling it. Okay, no all thanks. right, so let's say we've already done that and it's pretty clear that a no is a no. How I explain that is really important, okay? One dimension, personal, is it personal? I can say, oh God, I screwed up again. It's entirely my fault that this guy didn't buy. I messed it up somehow, okay? You explain it that it's personal, you're less likely to flourish. If you expl but because there's, there's an alternative explanation. You're this less guy, likely, okay. If, if you explain it, it's personal. Ah, oh, it's all my fault. Yeah. You're, you're less likely to remain buoyant and actually be, be effective. Okay. Because there's, there there's plenty of other alternative explanations. Maybe this guy didn't want to buy. Maybe this guy is broke. Maybe this guy is going to get a divorce. Yeah. All kinds of reasons. So, so it isn't, you know, it isn't, most things are not entirely personal. Right. So if you say, hey, there are other explanations besides my incompetence, all right? Quest second question. Uh, is it pervasive? So you say, so I could say to this, oh God, this always happens. I can <laughs> never get anybody to buy this. Bad stuff. luck streak. I can never, it, oh, that's actually a little bit better. That's, that's a better, a bad, a bad luck streak is a little bit better, but saying, oh, this always happens to me. Yeah. I just can't get any, instead you should say, is it pervasive? No, maybe I'm just having a bad luck streak. Yeah. Or, um, no, this isn't pervasive because last week I sold three of these things. Yeah. Okay? Third one, permanent. Oh my God, I didn't make this sale. It's, it's over, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm all done. All is lost. I'm finished, all is lost. Usually that's not the case. Yeah. And so the more you can explain things as, they take a wider view of it, and it's not false cheeriness, it's actually, it's actually looking at things through a wider lens. Mm -hmm. No, it's not entirely personal. No, it doesn't, it's not all entirely pervasive. No, it's not gonna ruin everything. Yeah. And what's what social psychologists call decatastrophizing things. And when you explain failure, in those kinds of terms, uh, you actually are ready for the next one. Yeah. It's a resiliency, isn't it? It's, it's similar to resiliency, yeah. Having started a business in 2007, right. I understand this, <laughs> this concept. Having, having, having uh, uh, chosen as my, as my profession um, uh, writing words on printed paper mm -hmm. in an era where that's becoming archaic, I deal with resiliency and buoyancy all the time. Yeah. Most people out there do not want to buy my book. Um, but there's some other people out there, if I can reach them, they're going to love this book. And so yeah. if, I get, if, I, if, I, if I crumple every time, it says, ah, I'm not that interested. Yeah. Uh, What's some of the uh, rejection you've gotten, just either from publishers <laughs> or people who want to buy? Give us, give us a little insight into your life. Oh, I'm trying to think of what kind of rejection. I mean, I mean it's so, it's so oh, I can't say it's pervasive, but, uh, because that would, that would uh, not be decatastrophizing. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, went out with my, when I went out with my first book, um, there were several agents who weren't interested, there were several publishers who weren't interested. Yeah. And you hear that story over and yeah. over again yeah. about the guy and then who ends up selling a gazillion yeah, yeah, copies. Yeah, no, and I didn't, I didn't even have one of those, I didn't even have one of those things where I sent out, you know, you know, where I sent out 50, you know, went, went to 50 publishers and everyone rejected me. I, I didn't have that. But I did have people say, no, that's not very interesting. No, thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time. I mean, that, I, you know, I go to a, or, my, or, you know, with my publicist, I'll go to a radio station, talk to a radio producer and say, hey, we've got this awesome book out. It's about how we're all in sales. Gives you all this great science, all these great tips. No, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. y you know, the nature of my work is so much I in being essentially in the idea business is, Rejection after rejection after rejection yeah. after rejection. So is it a numbers game? I, I, again, I'm thinking of yeah. like the old Napoleon Hill concept of like three feet from gold, right? You have no idea how close you are yeah. to yes. You've gone through 999,000 mm -hmm. no's and like the next one's the yes. But then is this kind of like a, ma a last man standing contest where you just got to hang in there? It's a tough question because sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Yeah. And it's hard to... And, and so one of the things is knowing for sure, you just could have something that nobody actually wants. And so <laughs> at some point you need to... Yeah, well, I, and, and maybe we should point out too that maybe we don't want that at that particular time. Maybe yeah. the timing wasn't right, right? Right. There's several people ahead of their time... No question about it. ...that produce products and services that... No question about you know, it. We're, ...we're loving now but didn't love back then. No question about yeah. that. And so, you know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to make that... It's hard to have a universal rule about that. Yeah, that's the next book. <laughs> well, actually, you know what's interesting is that our mutual friend Seth Godin wrote a book kind of sort of like that, The, the dip, dip, yeah. right, which is basically you're going to go down like this, and yeah. is this because you're going further, or is it because you're about to go back up yeah. like this? No one to quit. When I, yeah. I, I've read the book. It's, what, only like 85 pages or something, but I'm still, uh, like, 
I want to know. Like, uh, it's, yeah. it's a tough one. It's a tough yeah, one. It, 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 it's, it's life, and so it's not an algorithm. I mean, yeah. We all want an algorithm. We all want a simple set of a formula, a simple set of rules yeah. for when to do this. And in that particular dimension, they're, they're, um, the rules don't exist. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to your acronym. Uh, you've been covering some of the letters. A, B, C, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. A, so attunement, B, buoyancy, C, clarity. Should we talk more about clarity then? Clarity is, I'll give you one thing that I thought was one of the, I think one of the, something I thought was really, really interesting in, in here about, about clarity, which is a lot of times we tend to think that it's all about changing people's minds. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it's about giving people an off-ramp to act. And I'll give you one, I think one of my favorite studies in the book, it's a study of a food drive at a university. And here's what they did. They asked students, who are the people least likely to give to a food drive? People who don't care about it, you know, who are the people they don't care about it, their fellow man or woman, yeah. okay? And who are the people most likely to give to a food drive, the okay. do-gooder types, okay? So they take these large groups of people. The, 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 I ne these people will never give. These people are do-gooders. And then what they do is they send them letters. Now, again, we're going to have to split these in half. So they send half each of, of each group a separate letter. One letter says... Um, like an A-B test. So it, it is. It yeah. is. It, it's an A-B test with two, so it ends up being four. Okay. But it's, it's um, they say to... One letter says, we're having a food drive. Dear student, we're having a food drive. It's on such and such a day. Hope you'll contribute. The, uh, and so that's the one likely to contribute, probably. Uh, pardon? That's the, that's the group likely to contribute, right? No, it seems the, both groups are getting that letter. Right, but I'm saying the verbiage that you just mentioned, is, is it not targeted to the ones that are likely to bring the food? It's targeted to everybody. It's targeted. Okay, we, so already, we already identify, we identify the people who are least likely, the people who are most likely. I'll let you keep and they get And they get the same letter. Okay, okay? got it. Half of each group gets the same letter. Okay, I Dear understand. student... Um, we're having a food drive. Here's when it is. We hope you contribute. Okay. okay. Then half of each group gets a different letter. The letter says, "Dear, it's personalized. Dear Brian, we're having a food drive on such and such a date. Right. Here is the food that we. There's certain kinds of food that we that we want. Um, um, the the food drive is taking. There's going to be a drop off place on campus that's going to be around from one o'clock p.m. to three o'clock p.m. Here's a map." to go find it. Right. Now, what happened there? So, so, those, are the, so those, are the two different, those are the two different kinds of letters that they got. So yeah. what happens? When the people not likely to give get the very generic letter, they don't give anything. Right. But when the people likely to give get the generic level letter, they don't give that much either. And here's where it gets interesting. When the people not very likely to give get that letter that gives them an off-ramp to act, they're three times as likely to give as when the people likely to give get the generic letter. In other words, mm -hmm. what it was, it's, it's not, we, we overstated people's, the importance of people's propensity to give. If we just made it easy for them, if we gave them an off-ramp to act, you can actually change their behavior. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful insight because we're mm -hmm. focused so much on changing people's minds, changing people's minds. Persuading them, yeah. When in fact, actually just giving them an off-ramp to act mm -hmm. uh, actually can be much more effective. So if I'm in a face-to-face -face meeting, it's not a letter, and if I'm making a pitch, yeah. it, I should make it as easy as possible for people to take action. And here's how you get it. You know, after I leave, you know, here's the link, and you know, here's a special code. And you know, what, should, what can I do if I'm in a in a pitch meeting in person? Well, what you can, well, I, mean, I think what you can you can do in, you can do a number of different things. You can first of all think through all these things work together. Think through that person's point of view. How does that? What does that person need to do from his point of view or her point of view, not your point of view? What are the what are the steps a person needs to take? And then try to make those steps as easy. <laughs> As possible, yeah, and that can that can actually enable behavior, um, in some cases, more powerfully than trying to change somebody's mind. Parting words for uh, entrepreneurs at different stages. So, um, I'm an I'm an entrepreneur. I've got a great idea. I'm in a VC pitch, and I want to I want them to accept my offer. Yeah. What advice do you have? Um, think about the other side's interests. Number one. Think about the other side's interests. Try to answer, figure out what are those, what is that other side interested in, all right? Two, try to figure out if you can solve a problem that they don't realize that they have, okay? Three, be ready to hear offers. It's a lesson from the improvisational theater. Improvisational theater gives us, I think, a smarter, more effective way to, quote unquote, overcome objections. In every 
every, every question you ask me, everything that you might disagree with me about, embedded in there is an offer. So get better at hearing offers. So I think those three things can be in incredibly effective. One, let me give you one other more tactical thing at the level of the pitch. This is cool. We pitch too often with statements, not enough with questions. You're going to love this. This is the best idea since yeah. sliced bread. Yeah. Or even saying, we are going to be the, uh, the Amazon.com of rutabagas or something like that. Yeah. Um, People love comparisons. Yeah, and that, that, can be, that, can, that can be useful. That, that, can, that can be useful because people are, people are always asking, you know, one of the most important questions that you can ask is compared to what. So, but um, we don't pitch enough with questions. Um, and there's research out of Ohio State that, so, that's, that tells us that when the facts are clearly on your side, pitching with questions is more effective than pitching with statements. Why? Because questions are active. So if I ask you a question, even if you're not enunciating a response, you're thinking about a response. And you're talking about not yes or no questions, but sort of open-ended. It could be yes or no, too. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Let's talk about um, Ronald Reagan, 1980, running for president against Jimmy Carter. Carter was elected in 76. Reagan is running in 1980. The economy has deteriorated significantly. He could have said something. The economy has deteriorated significantly. Instead, what did he say? He said, are you better off now than you were four years ago? Power, one of the most powerful uh, pieces of political rhetoric in the last 50 years. Why was it effective? It was effective because the facts were on his side. Yeah. People's situations had clearly deteriorated. But the reason that it, the question was more effective than the statement is this. When I ask you a question, as I said, it's active. You have to think about it. So yeah. what happens? You ask me the question, are you better off now than you were four years ago? In my head, I'm thinking, 76, 80. Oh my God, no, it's, I'm not at all. Yeah. And then you, yeah. you begin summoning your own reasons for agreeing with someone. When someone comes up with their own reasons for agreeing with you, that's good. I like it. All right, now let's shift gears and talk about a business owner. You know, they're trying to move more widgets. You know, I've got a, I've got a business and sales are down. Um, we haven't talked about platforms or techniques or social mm -hmm. media, any of that. Yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, that? I, didn't, I didn't, well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't write that much about, uh, about, e about any of those. I mean, yeah. I think that at some level it's, you know, a lot of the stuff is platform agnostic. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's well, these are principles we're talking about, but how, what's your personal feeling about the use of the new media? I'm all for it. I mean, I, I think that they give us new ways to pitch. Every email, for instance, is a pitch. Uh, tweet, tweet or, tweeting, tweets give us... Tweets give us a new way to pitch. Yeah, you're pretty active on Twitter, right? Yeah, I'm active on Twitter. I like Twitter a lot. I like Twitter for both things. I like Twitter in order to sort of get my ideas out there, see how people respond. I like to listen on Twitter, see what people are talking about, mm. see if they're saying, hey, this book is awesome, or hey, this book stinks. Yeah, I, it is a great listening tool. You can, can you imagine, you know, someone, I think it was Scott Stratton who, who asked me that question. Can you imagine 10 years ago if we could, you know, be the fly on the wall and listen to what our customers are saying about us and what our customers are saying about our competition? And, you know, it's an amazing tool and people, are kind of ruining it, right? Uh, as a lot of these guys are saying, because they're just blasting out, just like talking over someone else and not listening. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I, it's a it's a very effective it's a very effective uh, it's a very effective listening tool. The other thing is that there's research on what makes an effective tweet, and when we think about the pitches, and so it goes back again. Actually, questions are very effective forms of of tweeting. Questions actually foster engagement in ways that simply declarative statements. I had a ham sandwich for lunch, or yeah. United Airlines stinks is not um, very helpful. Uh, actually, the, some of the research shows that even self-promotion isn't that bad. People don't recoil at that if it's providing real information. If it's providing real information. Yeah. So if I say, hey, I'm gonna, be at, I'm gonna be in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin, at McGillicuddy's bookstore at 7.30, come on out, that's fine, because people in Sheboygan Falls might be interested in that. Yeah, or for your Tony Hawk, and you say, I just dropped a signed skateboard off in Solana Beach, and people are gonna be stoked. Right. Yeah. So we're wrapping this up. Is there anything else we didn't cover? Ground we didn't talk about? I guess the, you know, one thing that I would add is that we have, it goes back to some of your earlier questions, Brian, this idea that sales is sleazy and duplicitous. It's just not right. I mean, at its heart, I think sales is fundamentally human. You're, trying to say, you're saying to someone, hey, let's make an exchange and we'll both be better off. That's how progress happens. And so I really think that, that especially now when, when there's not this massive information imbalance, that this act of selling can be actually, you can get better at it. You can do better if you're a little bit more human. I wanted to take a quick second to thank you for watching and listening. It means the world. Because in 2008, when I created this show, I was in a very different and difficult place. 
You know, up to that point, I'd worked for about 11 different companies and bosses. My last real job with a paycheck and health benefits was at Universal Pictures, working on the brand marketing and strategy team in the home entertainment division with budgets of over $30 million. I left Universal to pursue my dream of becoming a writer, director, and producer, having my own production company. So my little startup was brand new and self-funded, heading into the Great Recession, and I felt like I was in huge trouble. I created Behind the Brand to solve my own problem. The idea was to produce a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, and the stories behind their success so that we could take a page from their playbooks. Millions of you now watch and listen to my show every month, and I'm so grateful. And over the last few years, I've seen a lot of shows popping up that look like us, which is fine and predictable. But if you're new here, here's how I'm a little bit different. If you asked me how I built this, I would have to answer, it was an original idea born out of necessity, not imitation. I'm not a journalist with a fancy pedigree or someone who's never worked in business. This show is not distributed by one of the largest publishers in the world. We are fiercely independent and I'm proud of it. I'm not one of these multi-millionaires who built a show to promote their huge life insurance company, wine business, or real estate empire or to sell you self-help programs. Nope, I'm probably a lot like you. I'm married, raising four kids, and running my business. I'm in the trenches every day trying to keep my head above water and figure out how to be a little bit better tomorrow than I was today. I'm your eyes and ears when I go behind the brand. Thank you again for all the love and attention. There's no way I could do this without your support. If you feel like it, don't forget to leave a review with as many stars as you think is fair. I can stand on skill alone, but I'm a package deal. I can write the whole song and rap for real. I got my head in the cloud with a pun intended. I don't need to see nobody. I don't want no visits. Introverted, I just flirt with the music. Small